How do we make hospitality look good? Yeah, work-life balance is hard. Yeah, money may not be the greatest, but once you get up the ladder, you know, it's where you reap your rewards. You know, you can't just expect to be earning super great salaries if you've not really kind of done the graft, you know? So I, I've always said to anyone who's kind of walked into the restaurant, I'll be like, no, the more you're going to put in, the more you're going to get out, you know? Don't come and think of it as just like a job where it's nine to five and you just need to go and do that or do what you need to and go home. You've got to take it like, a, like it's your life, it's your passion. everyone welcome back to breaking bread birmingham food podcast presented by food obsessed mates liam and carl i'm your co-host liam that's carl all right you're right there mate you look like you're a bit lost <laughs> oh i thought someone was walking through the door i think the dog's coming in you look like you didn't expect me to introduce you then it's like but did you think i'd cut you out or something mate? yeah i was a little shocked oh here he is <laughs> here's the dog man i have a dog and he loves jumping up at liam when we're recording intros I think he's losing interest in me now. He's not even loving me today. Like, no, looking at me. He's getting old. He still comes straight over to you for a smell. I'll put a picture up on Instagram, people can see what my dog looks like. Yeah, that's a good shot. People should see our co host of the uh, <laughs> every intro. Shaking. You can hear a jangling in the background once the dog right, He's off again now. He's off. Come to have a look. Good visit. Yeah. <laughs> We better crack on. This is a long yeah, episode. <laughs> mate, this is a really long episode. Oh, this is one of my favourites that we've ever recorded. Yeah, though, Tom folks. just got away from us. This really happened when you get chatting and chatting. And it's Sonal's such a great guest. Obviously, today's episode is with Sonal Claire. You would have known him from the wilderness and Penal's restaurant manager at Penal's restaurant manager at Wilderness. Smellier of the year. GQ Smellier of the year. Yeah, yeah. I never say, I don't, I like saying Sam a lot. Yeah, Sam, it's easy I don't to feel say, like isn't I it? Say <laughs> it's quicker. <laughs> yeah, Sam of the year. Just what a oh, unbelievable story. personality. Like, what know, a life as well. The brand stuff ambassador for Champagne Company. We talk a lot about yeah, that. Crew. Unreal. Loves his food. Champagnes. Loves food. Love, really passionate about the hospitality industry. He's part of that I Choose Hospitality group now as well. Massive ambassador for that. Just, just a ma- big personality to have on the show. And we were lucky, we were lucky enough really to call him a friend. We were chatting to him quite a lot online. And yeah, we're bumping. He's one of them. He bumps into him quite a lot, don't we? Yeah, he's, he's got the tie. Up, stop and chat to you all the time, and he's really great. He's got do. an unreal memory. Yeah, he has got. He seems to remember. Like we talked about when we first met him, and that was at Panels, and we weren't even doing a podcast or anything then. And he even remember what wine we ordered. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It must and be this make, was like four or five good. years ago, something like that. Uh, three years ago. It was when we just started the podcast. It was ago. the first. It was our first Christmas as doing the podcast. Oh, there you go. And we'd never met him before, and he could remember what wine we had that night. Yeah, that must be what makes him so good. In fairness, yeah, yeah, yeah. This podcast could have easily been another two or three hours long, just oh. chatting. It was ridiculous. Like, just loved it. Like. So. We won't keep it too long since it is a long one, but you and for a really tree, this is one of my favourites. Yeah, we recorded at the Wilderness, and obviously, yeah. if you've Thanks listened to, to any, Alex for letting us do that. yeah, massive thank you to Alex for that. It's, if you've heard any of our episodes, we recorded at the Wilderness. It's a loud place in the background, even when there's nobody around, it's still quite loud in the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is a little bit of noise, and um, Sona had a habit of tapping the table when he was really passionate you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah when he yeah. gets into his talking there's lots of banging so you might hear a few thuds and bumps. you might hear the table tapping yeah i'm hoping you can look past that because the content is unbelievable what what the man is saying is worth every inch of your attention you can hear a lot of interesting stuff especially that wine and oh mate it's great and if you don't hear a lot from me that's because uh, champagne was being drank at the time of <laughs> recording this episode. Yeah, and it was a big shout out to Rare Champagne who supplied a bottle f- specifically for the podcast. Yeah, that was, that was nice very of kind them. of them, and it was a very nice champagne. It's not, that's <laughs> not your usual Monday night. Sitting in a really, really amazing restaurant, drinking really, really amazing champagne, chatting to a really, really amazing person. Like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doesn't get much better that's than that. That's a good Monday night. That's podcast dreams, that is, mate. Yes. Yeah. 
Awesome. So ho- obviously, I hope you enjoyed it as much as we obviously enjoyed recording. Yeah, I know. Smashed. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> yeah. As always, if you do love it, please tell us you love it. We've got big egos that need food. I'm joking. We just we we didn't love joke to about hear you. I've got big ego. I know you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just love to hear from you. And obviously, rate, review, subscribe, follow. Likes, all that jazz. Do anything, anything send it all our way and help us spread the message that Birmingham is an amazing place with amazing people and amazing food an amazing podcast <laughs> <laughs> awesome ladies and gentlemen Sonal Welcome to Breaking Bread, and how are you? Gentlemen, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, very good. Excited to be here, back to work on a Monday, day off, but it's all good. Do you feel <laughs> bad dragging <laughs> you back in on your day off? Like uh, it's, it's something I've been looking forward to for the last week, so, I mean, thanks for having me on, you know, so I'm very kind of grateful yeah, to, to be here, you know, glad to have someone there as well, you know, so. I think you're the first one we've had on as well. Yeah. I don't think we've had one on. Fantastic, there you are, that's what I like. Oh, I've got some questions about that. <laughs> <laughs> in fairness, though, like... We, I think, when was that cry thing? We we met at that cry thing, didn't we? In the um, Mariposa, or whatever it was. Yeah. And I think we mentioned it then about coming on the podcast. That was ages ago. Yeah, it feels like a whole lifetime ago. And obviously, we, that lockdown happened. And yeah, everything went uh, completely bonkers. So like. If we were getting a someone, it was definitely going to be you. Thank <laughs> you very much, man. I'm very grateful to be here, man. And thanks very much for having Award me. Award winning. Yeah, Gotta yeah, yeah. It's been a, <laughs> been, a, been a nice little ride there. Yeah, GQ some early of the year, 2018, which is really, really good. Probably won't ever stop talking about it, but... Or would you? Yeah, he gave us two business cards on the way in with it wrote on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really. Oh, one number 2,000 of those left, don't worry, man. There's plenty to give out. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get into hospitality, mate? Um, so I studied at the College of Food. Um, I did hospitality food management from... In, uh, in Brum? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was called um, yeah BCFTCS back in the yeah, day. Yeah. Now they must have run out of Scrabble letters and words now. So it's <laughs> UCB now. Um, and yeah, I went to do hospitality food management. I was like, obviously, kind of same kind of story. I think lots of people who were like in their childhood, growing up around food, you know, their family was involved in it. Um, I mean, I just used to watch my mom cooking lots of Indian cooking and stuff. And I was like, I'd love to kind of do that. Got an A-star in food technology at GCSE, and I was like, "Yeah, this is great, man." Flopped in everything else, but I didn't know why actually. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it wasn't one of those kind of Asian people to be like, "Right, you know, you need to." My parents weren't kind of directing me, so like, you know, you have to be a doctor, you have to be a scientist, and try and change the whole world in that respect. You know, I was like, "Right," you know, my sister came to University of Birmingham, and I really liked the kind of scene in Birmingham. I was like, "Right, I'd love to go there." You know, it's not too far from home. Where are you uh, from originally? So? Um, so I'm originally from Ealing in uh, London. Mm. Uh, so I came up to. Birmingham when I was 18 years old, did my degree, did a placement, so I went to Ireland. And that kind of gave me an insight into what hospitality is all about. It was the first time I worked in a restaurant. I mean, my first job, I worked for Safeways, you know, supermarket. You guys might be too young to remember those. No, no, no. they're yeah, still Safeways. They're yeah. still knocking around. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like trolley dolly, man, just going around, collecting all the trolleys from the car park, collecting baskets, and then jumping on the till and like scanning barcodes. Um, what did you do on your placement was it as a chef or yeah so basically the idea was that um, it was kind of last minute because I tried a couple of places and like they kind of fobbed me back they go oh look you know we can't really give you the opportunity because you haven't got any experience and I was like what the fuck's this about you know mm-hmm. the idea is that you're meant to give us the opportunity to work to gain experience in the industry um, so there was a one hotel in, uh, in Monaghan called the Newmore um, and they were like look we haven't got a job in the kitchen for the moment but if you want to start front of house I was like, shit, man, I don't really know. I've never like worked in fine dining. Like Fine dining for me was like going to Pizza Hut and getting Super Supreme. I was like, <laughs> yeah, 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 man, this is great. Move the olives out of the way. And that was it. So I never really knew what kind of fine dining was all about. Started working from the house, looking at this menu. It was kind of classic kind of French cooking with like Irish produce. Amazing. And when I was looking at the menu, I was like, what the fuck is foie gras? What is this? And then it was like, this is foie gras. And then I was like, I go home and I read about it. And I was like, all right, I understand what it's like. And probably not the most humane thing in the world, but I was like, understanding what kind of produce was all about. And then my manager at the time, he was like, look, Sern, are you interested in uh, learning a little bit about wine? I like, look, I've got a year, you know, I'll just try and learn as much as I can. And he goes, right, here you are then. So this is where the cellar is. Here's some of the wine, started learning a little bit, tasting a few things. I mean, I mean, I was 20 years old. I mean, it's the first time I've kind of really drank wine. I mean, I used to be at uni and just 
for you, and you got Southern Comfort Lemonade, Malibu Pineapple, like sweet things, you know? Yeah. It took me a while to get into pints now, and there I am, 37 years old, and I drink a pint of Carlin, you know? So <laughs> um, it was one of those, and it, yeah, just from there, I mean, I came back to university, um, did my WSET level two, which I smashed, um, and that was just kind of set me the platform to kind of get involved in wine. Um, I then went back to Ireland for a few years, um, was a restaurant manager uh, in a little small town in Warren Point. Um, which is amazing, beautiful kind of seaside town. I was there for two years, and I remember on, at university, I remember uh, eating at um, Chef Glynn's uh, first restaurant, Jessica's, or one of the first, and I was like, yeah, this is fucking amazing. And I was like, this is the guy I want to come to work for. Um, so 2009, came back and started off as a waiter and kind of worked my way up through there, you know? So, yeah, it was an amazing journey and just like obviously trying to learn the insides out and the foundations of what a restaurant's all about, you know? Yeah, how did the wine progress from what you from where you started to obviously where you are now? Like, was that at Pennells? It sort of really yeah. I mean, we were very fortunate. We were, we got a list there. It was what about three hundred wines on the list? You yeah, know? I've seen the wine list there. <laughs> it's, it's a Bible, isn't it? It's Bible, huge, man. Right? You can have it the old or the New Testament, you know. <laughs> but it was yeah, it was just a journey because I mean, obviously, then you do like the wine flight, so you get to kind of go home. And my manager at the time, he said, "Look, son, you know, take ten wines, um, go home, read about them, try and build up your own kind of." knowledge about it you know because there's a lot and there's probably still some that you wouldn't really be kind of too familiar with um but yeah it's just an amazing opportunity and then obviously you do like the, the the wine flights where you kind of introduce your wine you talk about a little bit about them and you just try to engage that with the guests but it's all about trying to kind of a find out what is the guest looking for and how you can kind of entertain their experience you know i presume you went through all the qualifications that make you go through to be one actually no you know um, no, <laughs> oh, <big laughs> don't, you, don't, you don't need to cut that out. Um, a lot, lot, lot of it has been down to being working on on the job, and that's not me really sounding like arrogant yeah, yeah, to say, yeah. "Oh, I know everything," because I definitely don't. I definitely don't. Um, it was just an opportunity where you go, actually, you know, what? you need to learn about this, and because of now how accessible it is, like you buy a couple of wine books, or you can study online, or you can kind of listen and watch other reviews, go down to do tastings. You want to make up your own kind of mind on what you enjoy drinking and what you know you can recommend to the guest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going through my level three at the moment. Um, so I'm looking forward to doing that. So that's been done online. Um, but no, I haven't done any of the sommelier qualifications, actually, which is something that I suppose in, in my kind of time in my career is probably something I can't really kind of dedicate my time to. Yeah. You know, I think if you're younger and you're kind of aspiring... It's something great for you to be involved in, but I mean, obviously, because it was a crossover being restaurant manager and then obviously looking after the wine, it wasn't something that was, I would kind of directed my kind of... self towards. Yeah, exactly. You know, it was like, well, it kind of came along as an opportunity and yeah. I just kind of grasped it and kind of enjoyed it, you know, just for the kind of interaction with the guests and all that as well, you know. Why go for the level three now then? Uh, well, um, one of my uh, suppliers very helpfully um, kind of said, oh, you know, are you interested in doing it? And I was like, look, I'm during lockdown. There was nothing going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was like, right, if you want an opportunity to do it. And it's good. I suppose in looking now in hindsight with level three, it's a little bit more different to like the kind of court of uh, sommeliers and the sommelier badge certification. It's like, I suppose you learn a little bit more about the kind of the- theoretical side of things. So you look about like things about the geography of uh, the climates kind of as opposed to just being like the basic kind of foundations of what grapes grow where, you know. So if you were to, let's say, own or you want to work as a wine supplier or something like that, you know, you've got that opportunity, you know, because people like to listen to that kind of stuff. I mean, but I suppose when you're in the restaurant kind of scene, there's not so much of that focus. Like no one wants to tell you about what the pH soil was in 2019, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, oh, hold on a second, just give me my juice, man, you know? <laughs> Did somebody say to you, like, off the bat that you had, like, a really good taste in wine or something? Did it, something like that that happened? Um, it was just one of the, I, I, In regards to the award, it just basically came around. I got nominated. I mean, I was nominated for the front house in 2016. And I didn't win. And um, just by, by coincidence, you know, I mean, on the, on the actual day when I went down, um, I went with my mate. Um, I was like, look, you're probably going to win, man. Let's just go. It's a free booze up. They said, get smashed, smashed, smashed. <laughs> and uh, that's exactly what happened. But then they were going through all the criteria, and then they were basically saying, oh, you know, so now Claire, uh, credit for what he does, tries to make the guests feel, bringing the experience together, you know. 
it was nice because you had all the great people like talking about it and saying that and then I just basically took my award and just got smashed again I um, was <laughs> walking around Houston at half 11 at night with a trophy and a three litre bottle of champagne it's like <laughs> fucking hell but no I mean it, it, it was it's one of those where you's, we've been very very fortunate in, in your in your time is that you get to try lots of different wines you know and it's like you educate your palate like that because if you always kind of stick with drinking what you already know and what you like you're not able to kind of open out your kind of your mind you know and it's it's about kind of understanding and say, well, hold on a second. If I know someone really likes to drink New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, I mean, we can always offer kind of alternatives if they wanted to. But I mean, if people still want to drink New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, I don't want to change their mind. You know, I'm not here to change that. You know, it's like if you guys go and buy a pair of trainers, and someone goes, actually, I've got, really, I've got these ones if you want. It's like, well, actually, I picked those. Why are you telling me to have something different? You know, so it's always quite difficult in that respect when you kind of like talk to a guest about that. It's like a very, very fine line, you know, with like, Getting it right and getting it wrong, you know. I meant more is in in when you were beginning, when you were starting out, uh, and you were just getting started in doing uh, being a sum. Yeah. And you you were undecided still on where which route your career was going to take. Did somebody turn around and say, you know, you should go with sum because you've got a real good uh, palate or something like that? Um, I think it was just kind of like you just kind of guided into a role. It was like, all right, so you know a little bit about wine. Um, are you interested in learning more about it? And I was like, yeah, sure, you know. Um, it was just, I suppose, that opportunity of, for myself as a person, it was like, I just wanted to learn as much as possible, really. You know, so it was like, all right, you know what, I'm trying to learn about customer service, learning how to do the setup of the restaurant, how to set a table up. And wine was also there on the side. And it was like, well, actually, you know what, let's start tasting wines. Let's try to make and learn as much as you can as you are still in that kind of progressive stage, you know? But yeah, I mean, it's difficult to say about about a palate because everyone has very different palates, you know. Everyone likes certain food. Everyone likes certain drink, and it's not to say, okay, you know, I've got the the greatest palate in in the world because I definitely don't. But it's like, well, I can taste flavors that maybe you guys may not taste, or we all have different flavors. You know, what we taste is going to be completely different. You know, yeah. um, but I suppose just nice. I mean, I was doing judging the Canter Wine Awards. Um, a couple of months ago and that was amazing because I'm, I'm there with masters of wine master sommeliers and these are some of the top people in the world and even then for me like I kind of fell out of my depth I'm not like, talking to them and we're judging wines tasting them all blind but it was amazing to see what kind of notes and tasting notes that they made compared to what I made you know and I was like wow you know you kind of feel you're a bit out of your depth but it's such a learning experience for yourself as well to do those kind of things you know but again it's always like for me it's always about tasting 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 and it's like Trying to kind of keep evolving, palate, trying to make notes, mental notes, and do people tell you what the notes are? Like you, someone's got oh, it's got a hint of coffee. Does someone say, try this one? This has got a hint of coffee. Can you taste the coffee? And then you pick it up, or is it just you own development? Yeah, it's it's really quite hard, you know, because like if you go down to tastings, like you go down to tasting in London, so you do like portfolio tastings with some of our wine suppliers. So you basically just go around um, for like four or five hours. Great day out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great deal and you, I mean you, you'll go there and you might be one of the suppliers so you'll go hi so now welcome blah 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 you want to try this you try it you don't really kind of they don't tell you like these are the specific tasting notes but again you can kind of go and do your research and then they'll tell you I mean from the service side in the restaurant I try not to kind of tell people too much about the wine because I'd like them to kind of search for it themselves you know if I say you're having uh, I don't know let's say you're having salt chili squid I mean you'd be saying, I, I want you to taste the salt and the chili. It's like, <laughs> if you're drinking red wine, you know, you might just say, all right, you know, you might taste some red fruits or black fruits, or there's a little bit of kind of oak, which kind of brings a little bit more that kind of complexity to the wine. But you don't want them to kind of, you don't want to give them too much because you want them to kind of enjoy that challenge of like searching for it themselves. Yeah. You'd have to wonder then, maybe you put it into their heads. Exactly, that's, that's the other yeah, thing, you know, because yeah. if I tell you, yeah, you're going to smell coffee, you probably smell coffee, even though you're drinking the coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but and, and that's the thing. Sometimes you know, it's like you you can kind of like it's not psychological. You don't want them to, you don't want to be telling them what they should be smelling. Well, I suppose you want to tell them what they should be smelling, but you don't want to really tell them. You want them to kind of like search for that themselves. You know, you go to the supermarket and it will tell you like light cheese, pineapple. I mean, I remember at uni, like I was there and I was like, well, I'm gonna get a bottle of wine. I never drank wine. I was 18, 19 years old. Took a bottle of wine. I was like, I'm gonna taste pineapples, lemon, and grapefruit, and I was expecting it to taste like fucking a tropical juice <laughs> yeah, but i was no. like i don't taste no pineapple i don't taste no lemon what's this do you know what i mean it's not like lilt you know um i think that's one of the things and you kind of like slowly kind of really kind of try and figure out 
how does this come about and what kind of flavor profiles is it that people really enjoy? So when they do like a Malbec, they like it quite full body, they like it quite juicy. So then, right, let's try and find and gauge and say, well, what can we do that's a little bit more alternate, you know, if that's what they're looking for. Because obviously you do the wine flights for tasting menus yeah. in all these restaurants. Do you find that you have to not necessarily put what you'd want with each dish and put what you think other people would want? Or do you just think, no, this goes, I know it goes, this is on the... This yeah, is I mean, it, it's, it's, it's very kind of difficult because you want to try to make sure that you can give the guests an experience because they're paying serious amount of money, you know? So it's about delivering something that, A, that you personally don't maybe enjoy as much because you actually think, actually, this wine works really, really good with this dish. So you're trying to find that right balance. You know, you talk with the guys in the kitchen, you say, well, hold on a second, what flavors do you think will work really, really well? What kind of wine? The guys will try it in the kitchen. We talk a little bit about it and uh, try to kind of enhance the whole experience, you know? So you try not to, you try not to showcase just wines that you really, really like, you know? I mean, there might be times when I've got a really, really nice wine and I go, yeah, fuck it, man. I really want to put it on. <laughs> yeah. And I would just try to find where I can put it on Should the list. Put it into there somewhere. Exactly. Where, where can I put it into the menu? Like when you had the English, English wine, the Danbury Ridge. Um, and I went down to the winery and, uh, you know, you, you, you get into the story, you know, you believe in the story, what they do. And you kind of think, well, actually, no, I want to put it on by the, by, by the glass and put it on the wine flight because I want people to try it. It's English. It's amazing. You know, would you ever bring a wine to the chefs and say, make a dish that we'll go with it? Well, I mean, that's one of the things. I mean, obviously that we've got a, an amazing uh, event, uh, on Thursday, which is the rare champagne, um, probably going to be gone when this gets published but <laughs> <laughs> sorry guys um and what we'll do then is basically that we'll tailor the menu to kind of allow the kind of champagne to be a little bit more kind of shining you know um so you kind of alter maybe a couple of the ingredients the flavors um maybe add a little bit more kind of seasoning in the sense of like maybe using like herbs or um more indulgent flavors just to kind of really kind of enhance um, what the champagne's all about. But I mean, that's something for myself is like, you know, if someone goes, if someone goes oh, certainly what would you want to do in like 10 years time? But actually, you know, if I had a wine bar where you basically have the food tailored to the wine. So you have like, I don't know, let's have, you've got an amazing glass of white wine, like Burgundy, Chardonnay. And then you have a chef who makes you like certain dishes. So you go, actually, you know, here's some like really nice earthy flavors and a little bit of, I don't know, caramel popcorn or something like that. And you go, actually, you know, we make the, the food for the wine. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those where you, you, you want to kind of bring both of the, uh, the worlds together just to kind of bring that experience to the, uh, to the guests, you know, it's like, we will kind of tailor this and we try to make the wines suitable. I mean, at the moment on our wine flight, cause it's kind of more leads towards a white wine. It'll be like, if a guest comes in and goes, I said, I need to drink red. I'll be like, look, I'd rather you spend your money and have a nice bottle of red wine. Cause I don't want you to kind of leave underwhelmed in that respect. You know, you want them to come and have a good experience, but you don't want to be selling them something that they're not going to kind of buy into, you know? Is that something you've learned the hard way? Or? Uh, I suppose with experience, you make mistakes. Yeah, you especially know? when you're younger, you think you know it all, you got the big bottle of chicken. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, I'm going to tell this person what well, goes that, with their dinner tonight. That's the thing, you know, I mean, when, when you're young, you know, you kind of think, right, you know, you, you think you know a lot. And uh, it, that's, that's, I think, being working in service and doing wine, you know, you kind of think you know, and you try to say, oh, and I've been in those positions, you know, when people go, this is what I want to drink. And you go, no, no, you should have that. And they don't seem as overwhelmed as how they would have if I just kept my life simple. Yeah, and if it was bad and they didn't enjoy it, then that's your fault. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, then I'll say, right, you know, no problem, I'll replace it. And sometimes the guests, I suppose, when they come to a restaurant where they come for an experience, you know, they kind of feel that they need to be guided. Because they'll be like, actually, no, I'll go with whatever you recommend. But then there'll be some people who go, actually, no, I know what I want. I just want to drink that. Um, well, I've got a bit wine list the most daunting thing in some places you go in like the food like obviously taste them in it's a taste them in you know yeah. what you're going to get you ain't got a choice but you look at a wine list in some of these places you said in Pennells the wine list is that big yeah. and you look at it you're like I haven't got an absolute yeah. fucking clue what's order here yeah I think from a kind of wine perspective you know from front of house it's like someone's baby you know it's like almost like you know you, when, when chefs are there they kind of pride them their produce and from a kind of sommelier or a restaurant manager anyone who loves wine they almost want to have this little book you know this this is my like this is my life kind of book it's like this is what i've invested in with like the the owner's uh money so you treat it like it's your own you know so you don't really take the piss i mean you've got some restaurants like in london you know you look at their wine list and you go yeah fucking hell you know you walk into their cellars and you're looking at three thousand pound bottles of champagne you're like Jesus. don't knock that down 
Does it actually taste that much better? Um, I think what it is with wine, I'm going to sound like a politician here because I'm not <laughs> going to say yeah. I ain't going to say no. I mean, what it comes down to is that, you know, when you buy into wine, you don't just buy the price tag. You know, you're buying into the history, you know, the the, the rarity, the, the luxury of it. You know, you're buying into the story, you know, like the people who've been making wine there for 400 years, you know, and how their wine kind of, sellers have developed and their wine stories developed you know and then you're you're paying for that prestige i suppose you know it's like you know if jimmy Choo released like a 50 pairs of shoes they'll charge a stupid amount for it and it's like well there will be 50 people who buy it yeah you know and i suppose it's down to the market because i mean people like around the world who would say let's say we had a bottle of wine here that's 100 pounds from france and then they can export it to japan or america they can sell it for five times as much you know, so it all comes down to those kind of things. So it's like supply and the uh, demand kind of uh, aspect as well to look at, you know. On the flip, flip side of what we've just been talking about, what are you like as a customer in a restaurant? Do you sit down and say, yeah, yeah, yeah keep this. I know exactly what I'm drinking. Or do you just go with it? I always look for the 25% off Uber, man, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's always hard, you know, when I go out to eat. Um... Because, like, I'm a normal person, you know. People always think, oh, son, I bet when you go out, what do you like to drink, what do you like to eat? Like, I mean, I, I, I drink Carlin and banana sambucas on a Sunday, do you know what I mean? <laughs> I'll have a few Jaeger bombs, I'm not too sure about that, about how my heart feels about those kind of things. Um, but I just gotta have a good time, you know. Like, I mean, in, in Birmingham, I mean, I really like Facenda. Because um, I like the customer service. Like, people are really, really nice you and know, friendly loads in there. of people have banged on about how great that we place is. We ain't got there yet. Yeah, and then sometimes for me, I suppose food doesn't kind of take the priority as much. Um, but I mean, yeah, I love going to like little places, getting like fried chicken, pizza, burgers. Um, I'm a big fan of like stacks. I don't know if you guys have been there. Yeah, no, 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 man, no, I've heard it's insane, great. Insane, but like, I'm a big Bonehead fan. Yeah, Bonehead. That's what we found out today. It's Yeah, I saw yeah, that as well. Yeah, and I'm well excited. Bonehead. Yeah, I mean, we used to have like star foods so every Saturday. We'll have like a little cheat, a uh, little treat, like you know, so like we get uh, OPM, we'll get like Meat Shack, Bonehead. Meat yeah, so many, so many good places, and that's the kind of food. That you, I like to eat sometimes, you know. I mean, luckily, I mean, I was on holiday what last week, so I was in Edinburgh and Cornwall, went to some amazing restaurants. I was just kind of like gauging what what they're up to and what they're doing, you know. I mean, like, especially from the from the wine perspective, you see lots of people who are moving towards this kind of natural kind of wine kind of scene. Some are keeping it quite conventional and just kind of say, well, that's their kind of ethos and what they're proud of serving, you know. So it's it's all really interesting, you know put you on the spot what do you think of all the organic and natural wine stuff yeah i'm gonna be honest I, i'm not the hugest fan of like the natural wine um i love all the people who support it i completely understand the small little farmers who are making juice and there's great history to it you know um we do have some on the list um and i do drink them every now and then in fact i had one yesterday um with alex from cars which is really really nice I had like a pet nat and also uh, the guys in wine freedom doing a great job and again it's making it accessible to, to to the market you know getting like the younger drinkers into it you know um i like i don't mind like the minimal intervention styles um i happily drink it if it's there um but if someone says to me do you want a glass of chablis or would you like uh, a funky kind of wine from siberia or whatever i'll be like it's not really my gig <laughs> um but that's just that's just my personal taste you know i mean like i said if, if it's there i'll drink it but I, I like i like to appreciate it more but personally it's not really my kind of cup of tea unfortunately for me it seems a bit weird to just restrict yourself to that long because it you, it's like saying well this might not be the best wine but it's ethical <laughs> yeah yeah, I mean? well, yeah i mean <laughs> surely what this is really is it's trying to be that you, you're trying to give somebody the best you know the best food the best service yeah the best wine so and uh, i mean I, I suppose from like that when you talk about that perspective of being like ethical and it's like you know these people like they'll have like flowers growing on the vineyards you know with in looking after the environment and from that perspective yeah 100 percent, man i get it but when you talk about minimal intervention, it basically means that the, the the winemaker has basically had very, very little to make with the wine. So they've basically just taken the grapes, almost crushed them, pressed it, fermented, and that's it. You know, whereas there's been no kind of thought about, oh, what's this wine going to taste like in five years' time? Because there's no sulfur, there's nothing to kind of help stabilize the wine. So you're drinking very, very un unpredictable things. And if you are a very, very small farmer and you're making small amounts and half of it's like ruined what you're going to do, you know? It's funny, actually. I was at dinner with Paul. Do you know Paul Fulford? 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was saying the same, exactly the same thing. He says, I, I love a lot of the uh, natural wines that I've been tasting and organic wines, but he said, trying to find a consistency, he said, trying to find three bottles the same has been quite difficult. Yeah, I mean, that's it. You can get like three bottles and one could be okay, one could be slightly oxidized and mm. one could just be falling flat on its face. But I mean, I'm very open to kind of try it. You know, if suppliers come and go, saying I've got a couple of these wines, you want to try them. If there's a space on the list and I think it's worth it and I can justify it, then I'm very, very happy to take it. Just because I don't like it doesn't mean that I will not have it on the list. And I think that's, I think that's where it's quite hard for sommeliers to kind of accept that as well. Because some people will say, actually, you know, I don't like that, so fuck that, I'm not having it on the list. Whereas there will be a market for it, you know. And I suppose here, you know, we try to kind of give a guest the opportunity of trying not just wine, but obviously the, like the mix, mixed wines. We've got the hacked wines that we're introducing. And they also do a zero ABV. So like, you know, if you don't drink, you can come and still have an experience where you can drink, in inverted commas, um, but still have that experience, you know? So you have zero ABV wines, as you say? You no, know, zero ABV yeah. flight. So basically we make non-alcoholic cocktails. Oh, so the whole Rob, flight, yeah. Yeah, so you have like six drinks tailored to the menu. So we use like non-alcoholic. So it's not just like, oh, here's your seed lip and tonic. Yeah, it's like, yeah, uh, yeah, here's yeah, your yeah. Virgin Mary or your Virgin Mojito. Yeah, so actually, yeah. you know, Rob, who kind of spends his time, like the guy's a genius. He will be yeah, what was that? Though? I just had that. was delicious. That yeah, was. that was the uh, Hokkaido. Yeah, really, really lovely. It's like yuzu, cedarwood. Um, and a little bit of tea, and it's just really nicely structured. And you drink it, you go, yeah, fucking hell. I mean, with a, with a, with a little shot of vodka, it'd be all right. <laughs> <laughs> so it tastes like fruit juice, and you're like, wow. And, and the, and but the it's flavor. Quite interesting, more than fruit juice. Like, fruit juice is a very, like, just sweet. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe a bit of sharpness, but that's got a few, something um, to think about, you know. Yeah, and it's got like balance, and I mean, we compare that with one of the dishes, you know, like with like the cod course. Um, and people love it. And like, there's lots of people now who don't really drink as much, or like, they'll do like, uh, Stoptober or they'll do like um, what's it called in January I can't remember try January try January yeah so it's like well we'll try and give you the option of like giving you a good experience just because you don't drink doesn't mean you need to uh, not have a good time you know yeah 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 especially the amount of effort that goes into the alcohol actual alcoholic drinks it's yeah, nice yeah, to yeah. see someone actually putting the effort yeah into the non-alcohol side exactly yeah I mean I mean, and, and that's that's what it's all about it's trying to say well you come in here you come in for an experience um, to drink uh, alongside good food, be it alcohol, be it wine, be it spirits or whatever, you know? Yeah. So you were at Canals and you got up to general manager. How did you get up to general manager? So, hang on a second. Did you start at Jessica's or Pernell's? No, I was at Pernell's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pernell's when you started. Yeah, Jessica's where well, I had, uh, what, 2004, I think I ate there. Mm. And probably to this day, it's still probably one of the best meals I've ever eaten. Yeah. I was like, this is fucking sensational, man. Like, me and my mate, when we went to go, we bagged a table to get in on a Saturday night, like nine o'clock. And... Um, I was like, let's just go because it was just got Birmingham just got like their first mission stars. And I was like, it must have been Nats, Simpsons, and uh, Simpsons and Jessica's. Jessica's. Because I remember because it was like Jessica's and Simpsons, and I, you read it in the guide, it's like Jessica Simpson. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. how weird is that? Um, and even then, that was a lot for a city back then to have. Yeah, I mean, we're doing really well now, but even then, two still a yeah. lot. Still yeah. most of most other cities outside of London. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. And I was like, right, obviously you're into food. And it's like, right, where can we go? My mate came over from Ireland. And we were just talking about it. We got home and we were trying to like recreate like the dishes, like writing them all out and drawing them. What they, what, this is before you had like fancy phones, really. You know what I mean? So you couldn't really just take pictures and put them up on the Instagram. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was amazing. And that's why I was like, right, so I'm on Great British Menu. And I was like, right, I don't need to go and work with this guy. So I started off as like a waiter. Then the did basis, you go to him yourself? Did you apply for the proper channels or did you just stalk Glenn and say, uh, Glenn, give us a job, man? No, actually, you know what? I, I sent in my CV. I emailed them twice. I turned up on the doorstep. <laughs> so you did stalk him, yeah? yeah basically, yeah, yeah. So uh, my, my manager at the time, he was like, you are bloody persistent, you know? I was like, look, man, I really want to work here, like, regardless of what was involved, like. And got, got, I did a trial shift, really enjoyed it. Um, then got offered the job. So yeah, I started off as a waiter and I was like, had a really, really kind of great team who helped me kind of like learn, develop. And like, I was a restaurant manager in Ireland. I was like, yeah, man, I, I kind of know what I'm doing. I walked in there, I was like, fuck <laughs> me. What am I doing? And that was my ambition. I was like, you know, I want to be, I want to be a manager at One Star. Um, and that was my kind of goal, you know. You learn the basics, like how to wipe the table properly, how to put the chair in place, everything to a T, like everything was perfect. How you folded a napkin with a ruler, and it's like, yo, this is mad. This is insane, you know? Um, and there's always that attention to small detail. And then slowly, after a while, you start learning the dishes, you move up, uh, somebody leaves, then an opportunity comes. Certainly, you're interested in being um, 
they can go after the wine, then the assistant manager, and then came the, the, the restaurant manager, you know? So it was like, I was there, what, 10 and a half years, so I was manager there for like five years. Um, but yeah, it was an amazing experience, you know? It's like something that you always kind of strive to, you know? You watch people on TV, you watch the Golden Rams, you go, wow, these are, the, look at these people where they work in the environment they're working in, how professional these people are, you know? It's something you want to strive to, you know? It's, kind of get like excited you know you watch those tv programs you watch boiling point and all that you go yeah man fucking i'll go yeah, buzz here that. now for it you know is it common to be the top sum and the general manager because you're you were there and you are here yeah is it a normal position to be in well i think with the, with the wilderness because i mean the idea was um also i left uh Penel's 2019 uh in december and we were going to relocate the restaurant so alex was like look you know i'm looking for a general manager head sum to kind of take over um, when we would be relocated, so the idea was we're gonna go to Bennett's Hill, uh, where Nocturnal yeah, yeah, Animals yeah, used to be. Yeah. Um, then obviously COVID happened, kind of ruined all the plans. Um, and then we were like, right, hold on, what do we need to do, and what can we focus on in the kind of reopening of the restaurant? You know, so I suppose having kind of being very fortunate to have the skills of learning about the wine and also doing the kind of management side of it, you're able to kind of like gauge and find out what's right. You know, we still got Luby here, who's the restaurant manager. You got Rob who's had his drinks. So we've got really, really senior team here, you know. Everyone kind of knows what their roles, what their responsibilities are. Um, we've got a couple of the younger guys who help on, on, on the floor. Um, but I suppose, well, it's saving a salary, isn't it, really? You know, you've got a <laughs> yeah, two GM one. and a head sum, like, you know. <laughs> Did you see other people doing it or is it quite unique to yourself? Um, I, I, I think... I think for myself, it's just because I wanted to learn as much as possible, really. And I still do, you know. Um, but I mean, I go to other restaurants and you see they'll have like the head som there who may be kind of doing the entertainment as well, looking after the guests. Um, and I suppose it kind of kind of crosses over a little bit, you know. And I think I think sometimes it's a little bit more of it's just a title, you know. It's like, well, actually, you know, you can call yourself, the, I don't know, the head waiter or the chef de rang or head chef, sous chef. Everyone has these titles, you know, but... When you're in when you're in a restaurant environment, if someone needs to clean the pots and pans, GM will do it. You know, the head son will do it. It doesn't matter. I mean, I'll, I'll polish glasses if I need to. You know, but it's just obviously understanding what your roles, what your responsibilities are, and what needs to be done if it needs to be done. You know, which one do you prefer most, manager or sommelier? Um, I mean, to be honest, I probably enjoy the wine side of things more because I can just interact with guests. And plus, I get to drink more. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, I mean, even, lo even at lockdown, you know, I was very fortunate. You know, I had, like, suppliers sending me wines. And I was like, yeah, man, this is great. We're doing, like, Zoom tastings. And just opens up to uh, a whole new level of world, you know. I mean, I think, I think when you go into restaurants, people always look for the sommelier because they like to kind of... If there's those people, you know, those kind of guests who want to kind of have that experience when they want to talk to someone about wine, you know. If they're too, like, tired of talking to their girlfriend or their boyfriend or whatever, <laughs> you know. It's, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I had this really, really lovely bottle of wine. There's always just almost like a contact, you know, like a connection where you can talk to people. Oh, yeah, I was drinking this last week or last year. And, like, I have a guest who even, like, here at the Wilderness or when I was at Pernell's, people go, so, do you remember that bottle of wine you gave me, like, 18 months ago? I go, yeah, here it is. And it's like, how the f do you remember that? <laughs> I, I don't really remember what I do on the weekends, you know, let alone remembering that. But it's one of those things where you get... You, you almost build up a relationship through that, you know? And I suppose with the, with the, with the management side here at the Wilderness, I'm learning more about how kind of a business runs and operates as well. So when it comes to the service, you know, you kind of focus on the wine, but you still make sure you look after all the guests, make sure everyone's doing their job. I mean, we're only 20 seat at restaurants, so it's easy to kind of look after and kind of keep an eye on everything. And I yeah. suppose here, you know, and I'm super sure in lots of other restaurants, everyone kind of has each other's back, you know? They're all able to support each other. You know, when you've got the open plan kitchen as well, you know, the guys know, right, hold on a second, everyone's on the wine flight in the evening you can't be in 10 places at once. So they'll know, right, hold on, we have to hold back. Let's kind of have it controlled so the guest doesn't lose out or miss out on a wine, for example, or whatever, you know? Yeah. Was there something about Alex that you thought, yeah, I'm going to, I'm taking the chance and I'm going to go with Alex on this one. I'm going to move to the wilderness and see how I get from there. Was there something specific about I, the ethos that he has? Well, I think, to you? I think the idea that he was kind of showing me and giving me the opportunity to actually, you know what? Here's an opportunity for you to learn a little bit more about the business side of things, um, where you can kind of look at like profit and loss. And like, I'm Asian, man, but I'm probably the worst Asian at finances. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm yeah. rubbish. So it was like an opportunity to kind of learn. And I suppose the work-life balance for me as well kind of play a big part, you know, because it was only for so so, so long that I can do like the the hours that was required, you know, and like 
I mean, in my splits and stuff, I'd come home and go for a nap because it's like really, really heavy going. I mean, here I've got the flexibility. I mean, I've got laptops. So I can work from home for the first couple of hours. And having more time to kind of talk with people, talk with the business, talk with the staff, you're able to kind of have more time. So, I mean, we're only open, what, Tuesday to Saturday nights, Friday and Saturday lunches. Um, so you've got those afternoons to kind of study, invest your time in doing, like I'm doing the food safety, hygiene level three, um, and just kind of direct your time in a better way. Because, I mean... Nobody wants to be working on the floor every shift. You know what I mean? You, they come to the stage where you go, I can't do this, you know, finishing at one o'clock in the morning, starting the next day. It's like, there's only so much you can do before you say, fuck this, I can't do this industry anymore. And you don't want to lose that hate because when you're in the industry, you're in there because you love it. And when you're 20, 24, 25, whatever, you, you put in the graph because you go, right, this is where I want to be. And I always believe that whenever you go in for a, another job, it's like your your life should be made a little bit more simple, a little bit more easy, you know? So I've done all the hard graph now. Now I want to think, well, hold on, where can I kind of go to in terms of my own progression as well, you know? It kind of feels like the wilderness personality suits your personality too. Yeah, I mean, I never really kind of understood. I mean, I was like, obviously Alex was like, yeah, we've got the new place opening and we've got some good things happening. COVID happened. Um, but I mean, the, the, the clientele we have here is it's crazy. I mean, lots of guests go to Pernell's and they, they eat here. They secretly say, actually, you know, we've been to the wilderness and stuff. And I was like, oh, what are you doing here? Um, and they go, oh, yeah, yeah, we, 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 we like to kind of get around and go and eat in all the restaurants. Um, but I mean, the vibe here is amazing. I mean, you come in in the evening, the rock and roll music's playing and people just come here like they'll just say, I'll just come here for the music. Like, you know, they're coming for the food, be, be the music, be the cocktails, be the wine. And like, everyone just seems to enjoy it. And even if you've only got like, I know, let's say you've only got like 14 people booked on I mean, being 20 seat a restaurant. There's still a great atmosphere. And the ambience, I think, is like, it's incredible. And yeah, you're right. I mean, from wearing a suit to now wearing a, an apron and a t-shirt and wearing Air Force Ones, it's like quality. It's like, yeah, I can just like take it easy. And I was, I thought I was very, very relaxed when I was at Pernell's because I tried to make it really kind of accessible because I want people to come. And I know what it's like. Cause I'm, I'm bought up on a council estate, you know? So, I mean, these kind of things for me, it's like, wow, you know, you, regardless if someone comes in and drops a grand or someone saved up to come and eat in the restaurant, it's still an experience, if not more of an experience for the, those kind of guests, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, people come here and they just seem to have a, have a great time and enjoy themselves. It's, well, it's, it's, it's what we want to do is make people happy, you know? Just give people a good, a good time. Yeah, because I think they're both equally great, but they're just very different places, aren't they? Like? Yeah, they're different. Like, that's what I love, though. You can go to one sort of fine dining place and you've got to sort of dress a bit smart and another fine dining place. I mean, I can come in as I'm dressed right now. Yeah, yeah. Just We're naked. Chill. <laughs> <laughs> Just some pants. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, I think that's what's so good about uh, the Birmingham scene, you know? I mean, you, you've got so many different kind of styles of food, you know, if it's mission style, if it's fine dining, if it's casual food, independence, burgers, pizza, you, you can have wherever you want. You've got auto pizza, you've got all these amazing places where you can kind of choose where you want to go. And it doesn't always necessarily have to be like fine dining all the time. You know, it's, it's good every now and then. But I mean, even if you came here every day, you'd probably be bored, you know, because only so much of the same dish that you can eat. You know, if you yeah, come here three yeah. times a week, you'd be like, right, bloody hell, I'm, I need to try something different, you know? Yeah, you do have some loyal customers here, though, because I follow a lot of them online. <laughs> yeah, man, <laughs> we've got some... everything they do. We've got a crazy cult following, man. It's amazing. And obviously when we had like a little bit of like the mask gate thing going on like before we reopened like we had like this whole kind of rebel people saying you know what Let, leave these guys alone this is what they do if they decide to wear masks for whatever reason or not that's up to them but yeah I mean we've, we've got some really really loyal guests and I mean they just really come here just to have a good time again you know enjoy the food and obviously if we've got something different that we can offer them we'll try and tailor it up but yeah I mean we'll, we'll have like there's a guy who's been coming in probably about six times since we reopened I'm like yo man this is crazy you know, you always get to that level of stage where even like the junior team know what he wants to drink. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm quite good because I can kind of remember what people like, what they don't, where they sat last time. But when they know, they're like, oh, yeah. And you're like, it's good because then they're learning as well. You know, they're learning and understanding about customer service. You know, it's like, no, he sat on this table. She sat there. And yeah, we have a great, great following. Yeah, really, really good people all want to come in, have a good time. And we're very, very fortunate, especially about hospitality at this time of kind of crisis you know it's like it's almost going out there to kind of support those kind of restaurants you know 
And I think Alex also is very, very, very good in, in the way that he kind of operates, like, you know, with the social media and stuff like that. You know, he's quite engaging. He's been kind of quite proactive, you know, to the to the market and the situation, you know? Yeah, and accessible. Like, there's always someone, if you message him, he does message you. Yeah. Or if you put a comment, you like. <laughs> it depends what you comment, but you like. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, or we'll, we'll put it down with Jess, like, you know, on his Twitter, like, he's like, you, you see how he is on Twitter, like, and he's like always feeling sorry for himself, like, but it's, it's quite funny and it's, it's, it's good because I mean, it's, it's what makes, that's what kind of for me, like, Twitter's a bit more about. And then obviously you have the Instagram where you go all the lovely kind of pictures of like the, the food and everything like that. And it's just, it's just a nice way to kind of keep engaged, you know? And I suppose over lockdown, you know, it's like, as a restaurant, what do you do? You know, how do we keep ourselves busy? Because when everything's locked, it's like, like, well, you can get drunk at home every day, but it's like, there's only so much you want to drink. But it's like, we couldn't really work. You know, we, our job's about like talking to guests, serving wine, you know, making people happy with food, you know. You can't do that on a Zoom, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did the hacked wines come about? Uh, yeah, just something, um, me and Rob were like basically just sitting there and just discussing and talking about wines. And I was like, well, what happens if you kind of like manipulate like cocktail flavors into wine? So not like a sangria or anything, but it's like, <laughs> well, you know, what what can we do to make wine a little bit more fun, you know? And I mean, it's just... It's a very kind of, this is, I suppose Alex is, is, is like that. It's like, well, what can we do to kind of make things as disruptive as possible, you know, and controversial. So I was like, well, hold on a second. You're taking someone who really enjoys wine, who's won awards with wine. You've got a genius of a cocktail maker. If you bring those two brains together, what could you do, you know? So you'll have like, I don't know, like a, uh, a simple white wine, like a Chardonnay. And then basically kind of add in the certain like flavors and kind of elements into the wine to kind of take it to a different level. So it's something quite unique. So basically, probably something you can never get in the world because it's made here, Yeah. yeah you know? Yeah. And I, I suppose you kind of sell, I guess, the story. So look, we've taken the basic Chardonnay. We've introduced like this something called the Acetel, which brings in like vanilla components. So it makes you try and taste it like a, a more expensive wine. And it will be controversial because there'll be the wine connoisseur will be like, what are you doing to my wine? You know, you're, you are playing around with someone else's story and history. But again, it's fast to say, well, actually, we're giving you the experience of trying something unique. You know, we want to give you that service. So we take like a Riesling where we kind of carbonate it and we make like a sparkling Riesling, which is incredible. Yeah. I think you might have had it when you had the flight. Yeah, 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 did you? yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're like, yeah, this is really, really good, you know? And it's like trying to bring in two two worlds together, you know, from from a drink scene. And it's something that I've not, I've not seen in other places. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone seems to really enjoy it. And again, it's it's for fun, you know? It's not designed to kind of reinvent the world. You know, it's just, well, like, this is a wine. We added in flavorings and components and tried to bring a little bit of magic in the glass. But we look at like maybe smoking the glass and like placing like a, a, a strip of liquor in there. So when they swirl, it will all change. And it's all about like just kind of messing around with people's brains at the same time, you know? It's good though. It's like pushing the boundaries. What it is, it is. And that's it. it. You know, it, it, it's trying to be like that, you know, that challenging the guest to say, well, hold on a second. This is something that we've given you, but we fucked around with it. But we want you to enjoy it. Do you, you know, find people have been open to it. And yeah, I mean, we it. had like some guests who came in on Saturday and they were like, yeah, this is amazing. Like they've never drank anything like it before. I even showed it to a couple of my, uh, the wine suppliers and they were like, yeah, it's just pretty cool. Like what are you doing? Um, but yeah, guests have been, sorry. No, so I was just going to say, it feels like this is the kind of place you would get away with it though. Like the customers here. I'm not sure how receptive they would have been at like Penal's customers. To yeah. They might be a bit more traditional wine drinkers. Yeah, and exactly. I mean, that's, that's perfectly fine. You know, I mean, I'm the conventional wine drinker. I was going to say, did it take much coaxing out of you when you came here? Like, were you like throwing things forward and maybe someone was saying, that's a bit safe, try this? Or Yeah, I mean, when, I mean, when I came here, I looked at the wine list and like, no disrespect to what it was. It was, it was like very, very kind of left wing, very kind of natural focused. And I was like, all right, so I need to kind of like, the idea was for me to kind of say, well, what can we do to kind of maximize and generate a business that has kind of focused on the wine program, you know? Um, where like the most expensive wine was like, I don't know, 50, 60 pounds. It was like, well, there's only so much money then you can take from a guest when they come, you know? So it was like, well, what can we do to introduce more premium wines, but also still be able to deliver it where it's still valued for money, still accessible. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's always a journey. It's always like, we really want you to kind of give you the option of trying a nice glass of champagne or a really, really good bottle of wine or the Coravan where you can have expensive wines by the glass. But you still have to bear in mind you're playing with your owner's money, you know, so you can't just go out and buy every single bottle of wine in the world. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Do you and Rob sort of 
have a little struggle about how many wines and how many cocktails go on the flights? No, so I mean we've got our basically our own flight. No, we've got our own we've got our own our own our own flight. So like we've got the wine, uh wine flight, we've got the super wine flight where we've got like wines on the Coravan, uh alongside champagne, and then we've got the mixed flight. So the mixed flights where we've got the cocktails and hacked wines. So Rob kind of oversees that one. Um but I mean we'll always engage with the guests and just see what their kind of response is and how they've kind of taken to it. And most of the time they're like, Yeah, because when you go for the mixed flight, the idea is that you're going in for like Japanese sake. Yeah, that's what I uh, went for. You've got like Everything. the cider, you've got cocktails that we pair. And then we're like, right, well, let's throw in a hacked wine. And we might look in the future of doing a hacked wine flight. You know, we did an evening a month ago, which people loved. Um, we made like a fake champagne. Um, and it is just like kind of pushing boundaries. You know, you're like getting all these products in and it's just like almost being like a chef, so to speak, you know, with liquid. You know, well, what can we do to this and what can we make with that, you know? So it, is, it was a really, really fun kind of thing to be a part really you, you must know? have a great relationship with rob luck just yeah you know, rob's a great guy he's, he's a he's a when G- you're around other creatives it gets your creativity going well, that's the it, thing rob? you know you just bounce back you know and rob, you, you can sit sit talk to rob about a product and the guy will tell you more I, I, I promise i say this to everyone i say that guy you know he's like an encyclopedia you know mm. like if i talk about campari or something and he'll give me the whole story like <laughs> i reckon he knows more than the suppliers <laughs> themselves about their own products yeah. You know, and like to have someone like him and for me just to learn, like listen to him, you know, I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a great guy to, to kind of listen. And Always taking stuff to you and saying, try this. What you yeah, you know, and even that for me, because I'd be like, right, this guy's he's won an award. You know, he's a yeah. he's a genius in his own right. You know, and everyone knows about Rob's kind of what his, his profile and what he's done. And it's like, well, you know, you're, you're talking to him. So he even comes to you and go, oh, what do you think about this, this drink? Shall we add a little bit more of this? Do you think we should add a little bit more, uh, a little bit less? And I'd be like yeah mate you know just to be involved in that even with the young team you know he really kind of engages them and says look what would you guys think we'll do a taste on thursday we've got a sake tasting um so we'll go through like all the products any of the new sakis that are on the list talk about them so if a guest does come and he's not here because obviously he's got different kind of um things going on at the moment in regards to a possible new bar so we're uh, hoping that's going to be opening soon but it's trying to say well trying to get everyone on board so that everyone can explain the story that Rob knows, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How fun are the, like, special nights that you have to have for you? Yeah, really good. I mean, obviously, now we've introduced the um, the After Dark. Um, what's, what's that involved? Yeah, so basically, it's something that um, we were kind of... We do our management meetings every week, and we were like, right, obviously, Saturday is, like, a key date for us, you know? I mean, that's the busiest day in, in a restaurant. Um, uh, We can't really kind of turn the whole restaurant over because, obviously, you're here for two and a half, three hours. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, what can we do to kind of increase revenue but also kind of deliver a different experience so we came up with after dark which we've done two of now and we've got our next one um on the, it's on a saturday <laughs> <laughs> it bounces so we won't be doing it in december but it was like well what can we do to make it a bit more fun you know it's so like half 10 11 o'clock sit down 75 pound six course menu but a lot of kind of easy going food you know so like pizzas with brat ron and do ya you've got a uh, fried chicken wing you've got fargo ruffle cones and just kind of fun, easy foods. Like, you know, when you go home after a late night, what kind of food would you like to eat? I was going to say, it just sounds like food chefs eat when they get home from their shift. Exactly. <laughs> so it's like, it's like that. And just to make it a bit of fun, we've got a smoke machine on, we've got lights going on on the pass, and everyone just kind of gets into a relaxed frame of mind. You know, you might even see the guys in the kitchen, you know, having a little drink or whatever. So and that's after service, like about 11 it's basically, Yeah, it's basically, like an, it's basically like an after after service. Almost like when you go to a wedding, you've got like even supper, you know, it's like everyone just goes in. But you just sit down. Six course menu, 45 hour and a half uh, kind of dining experience, you know, is how long you kind of expect to stay for. You had anyone do both in a row yet? You know what? We had a guy who came in and he was like, oh, you know what? I'm already you, thinking you if I'm coming to that, I've come here first. Yeah, exactly. Stay, hang around in ah, the other one. We had someone came in on, the, on a Saturday night and he was like, oh, do you reckon we can stay on? I said, you can have some cocktails and stuff. I don't, I don't think he wanted to kind of stay on and have the evening supper. <laughs> yeah, like, help with the washing up. Yeah, exactly. But... um. It's one of those where if someone did and we had the space, we would. So, I mean, I think the first night we only did like 10 or 12 people. Um, now we've increased it to 16. Um, but yeah, I mean, the feedback's been incredible. And I think you're just trying to make that kind of accessible kind of style. I mean, obviously, you're not too sure what kind of people are going to be turning up at half 10, 11 o'clock, whether they've been on the lash all day. <laughs> yeah, Because technically, there's another couple of hours to look forward to to kind of go and eat. We've had a few by that time. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's trying to, I suppose, gauge into a new market. I mean, don't get me wrong, we all want, if we go for a dirty kebab at two o'clock in the morning, you know, it's like, maybe I can have a little bit of a fancy one, you know, because everyone still wants a bit of fancy food in the evening, you know? Yeah, I've covered some miles looking for a kebab at night. <laughs> I'll tell you what, 
it's, it's, it's hard work, man. It's like you're going on Uber Eats at three o'clock in the morning after a couple of beers, you go, oh, what am I going to eat tonight, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trying to find out where you want to go and eat for your, for your next food. Um, but yeah, I mean, we have our star food on in the afternoons and stuff, which is always great. All the boys in the kitchen take turns, make some really, really good, good grub for all of us to kind of tuck into. But yeah, I mean, the after dark ones, it's taken off really, really well, you know? It's a shame because obviously we didn't have a bigger a bigger space of a restaurant where we can obviously turn tables or do more covers. Um, but I think people really love the, the intimacy of this restaurant. You know, you know, I was just about to say that. I've been here a few times now. I was lucky enough to be here a few times. And I love where it is and I love how it is and I love the little setup. And I like that it's not too big. You get to some restaurants and they're just massive expanses of places and you're like, oh, fuck, you know. Yeah, I mean, even like, You've got the, the bar area, you've got the restaurant, you've got the kitchen. You know, every, everything is like in the right place, you know. You want to go sit, stand in the shed for a little while, polish some glasses. You can, you can see everything from everywhere, you know. And I think that's really, really quite a key thing, you know. Although you've got 20 covers in the restaurant, the kitchen are able to see right table just walked in the door. We've got one vegetarian, let's start getting the snacks ready, for example. Everything is just like nicely placed you know and one of those like people really love this building you know there's something magic about it you know yeah it's just got a real i like how it's not obvious on yeah. the road you sort of if you first time here if you don't know where it is you might get a bit lost it yeah. reminds me a lot of sort of japan all the restaurants are tiny yeah they're fucking impossible to find yeah <laughs> they're usually like the fourth story up in a tower block that doesn't look anything like the yeah, nice exactly. restaurant in I like that vibe. It's yeah. like a little bit of an adventure before you get your actual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, adventure. the problem is now we've got scaffolding on the front door, so like people are like, "Where are you guys?" And like, <laughs> well, we just come down that corridor. <laughs> yeah, and yeah you, it literally is in the wilderness now, you know. But I mean, yeah, we did a refurb um, over lockdown, so we came back. We got new chairs, new tabletops, bit of artwork and stuff going on. Um, and was yeah, just trying to say, well, what can we do to kind of keep evolving and try and keep changing the restaurant? A few new dishes, the whole menu changed when we came back. And we're all kind of looking at, right, what, what do we do now? So obviously we've got like a new dish coming on this week. Because um, like you said, you know, when you get lots of regular guests, it's like, well, you need to give them something different, you know? Like we've got a guest who comes in maybe twice, three times a month sometimes, you know? And it's like, you can't let them have that all the time, you know? Well, I suppose the chefs get bored as well. They want to be well, cooking different thing stuff well, yeah. and trying new stuff all the time. Yeah, and again, as well as like seasonal, seasonality. But I mean, you have nightmares with like, supplying fish meat stock supplies everything like even wine's been a nightmare to get hold of you know everything stuck in bond or um they've not been able to import you've got brexit you've got covid delivery drivers everything's all like been a been a bit of a kind of shit show you know um but yeah it's one of those and it's like keep pushing it's like well even with the wines and stuff you know you get a bit bored of sometimes serving the same wine so you kind of think oh i'm gonna sell something different you know so it's like yeah you, you still want to kind of keep changing up so do you have to taste every um, bottle of wine you open or something on the service? Oh, I wish I did. <laughs> We've got, like, so, I mean, lots of the wines now, they move moving the screw cap. So, like, screw cap is, there's a very high chance that it's not going to be corked or oxidized yeah. or anything, but there is still a chance of actually having a screw cap oxidized. We'll always have a little kind of taste of something new. If I've got it, I've got it on Coravan. Um, I've got some really good supplies. We send samples out, um, so we're able to kind of taste them. We'll spend the day maybe on Monday because of free piss up then. And so, it was like, I was just thinking some people have this like probably like, just complete fantasy like that some are just walking around the restaurant just necking glasses of wine like. yeah I mean there, there's some of the fine dining restaurants that you go down to London like some of the two stars three stars when you've got like a sommelier team so they're like yeah. let's say it's the three of us you know right someone's ordered a £3,000 bottle of wine but you're not going to not pour yourself a small little yeah, you're going to have a little taster <laughs> just, like, just that little bit just a thimble exactly it was like yeah, get my little shot cup out but yeah, I mean, you 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 have a little taste, or yeah, you, I mean, that's the way you guys will be, will be able to learn. So I mean, you'll talk about it, we'll taste it, we'll go, all right, what do we think? Is it good? Rah, 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 is it worth it? Can you justify spending that much money? Chance star, yeah. Um, but it's just it's just probably from the experience perspective, it's like, right, this is the wine because then you you'll need to taste it because you'll think, well, what can I pair it with with the with the food menu, you know? Yeah. But like, um, I don't want you to name names or anything, if you have got this story, but. Have you ever experienced somebody going a bit over the top and getting a bit pissed up during service? Or? Oh, in, in terms of staff? Yeah. 
<laughs> no, the, 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 I mean, there's been times where I've seen people be uh, a little bit merry um, coming into work. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I might have done it myself, you know. Once not, so or much, twice. not so much coming into work, piss. Like, I mean, like you know, like some of these. Oh, 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 during service. Yeah, during service. I better try that. <laughs> oh, I better try that. Wait. No, I mean the good thing is now you have got the mask on currently, you know, so you can hide your red <laughs> lips, you know, and people can't see, you know. Um, no, I mean, the, we, I think it's one of those where you can't really drink that much. I mean, you'll have a little taste of a drink. I mean, that's why during service or before service, I wouldn't like if I've got a taste, I wouldn't do one when I'm working after because I just want to get on it then. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or I'll have like three, four glasses of wine. I'll be like, yeah, I'm going to just smash that whole bottle in. I sound like a real alcoholic. It's true, though. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's one of those because you can't think, well, you've got something bought in. Now the chance to open it. Let's try it. Let's have a taste of it. See if it's any good. Um, and obviously, yeah, so it's about looking after the guests at the end. But yeah, you don't you don't want to get like people to get too too jolly on the, uh, on the nah, service. Of course not, man. What's and the most expensive wine you've tried? I've been very fortunate. Obviously, I've been uh, I worked with Krug over the last few years. I know you guys picked that one up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's a nice. So one. I mean, yeah, it's pretty special. And uh, we went in uh, Paris. So every year pre lockdown, I was um, going on, on like a trip as a thank you, an ambassador trip. And we were with Maggie Hernandez, who's the CEO. And she was like, "Oh, so now I've never met you. Blah blah blah. I heard you doing amazing things." Um, and we were making that ratatouille. And then she pulled out of a suitcase like the Clos Bonnet, which is like their prestige champagne cuvee. So, I mean, list price in London, you'd be talking about £5,000 a bottle. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, we had that on tap. Um, and it was that, yeah, pretty epic. I mean, could I justify it? Probably not. But if I had them, a, a millionaire lifestyle, I'd probably drink it and probably bathe in it. Yeah. She probably got like, the bottle for free, though, to be fair. Yeah, I mean, she's... <laughs> Top, top. I mean, there's only like the problem is this one of those, you know, it's like what I was saying is that if you're only making 1500 bottles of this in a year and it's only released every five years, it's gonna you can sell what you want yeah, yeah, yeah. and people will want to buy it because they just want to say, I can buy it, you know. What does an ambassador do that works for Champagne? Well, I suppose it's kind of like uh, getting a free drink, <laughs> <laughs> free trip every year, um, but also just kind of passing on the stories of what you learn, you know. I mean, you meet some incredible people, like, I mean, the, the most recent one I went to was in Marrakesh. And you're like talking to all these uh, Krug ambassades or restaurateurs uh, from around Europe. You know, so you've got people in Germany, Spain, France. So you almost have this small little kind of group of peers, you know, that you kind of look up to or talk to, uh, discuss uh, what they do with Krug. And you have this story and it's almost kind of gets like indoctrinated because you kind of come back and you're like, I want to sell Krug. I want you to know yeah, yeah. what I've been doing for the last few days. I've been on a hot air balloon drinking champagne. You know, I've been on camels living in the Riyadh for two days drinking Krug. You know what I mean? You you pass this story on and you almost, you, you get so overwhelmed with what you're doing. You go, I want to pass this on to you. I want to tell you about my story, you know? I think that's one of the nice things about it. And then obviously, yeah, like listening by the glass um, and just making it accessible and trying to make, well, what, what can we do to make drinking premium, that's not really accessible kind of luxury items, making it fun and saying, actually, no, we're not going to sell, can't sell you the bottles, 300 pounds is very, very expensive. But, you know, you can have a glass yeah. or you can have it on the flight where you can actually entertain yourself with a glass, you know. But champagne's not for everyone, you know. It's it's not really the kind of be-all and end-all. And some people really maybe say, well, I prefer drinking Prosecco or Carver or I prefer just drinking normal red and white wine. So it's trying to find that medium. You know, Just because champagne's my favourite doesn't mean everyone has to like it, you know. Got something nice there. Looks nice bottle. Yeah, man. So uh, I know Liam doesn't drink, but we've got Carl. Uh, I spoke to one of my suppliers. So Armand, big up yourself. Uh, this is a little bottle of Rare Champagne 2008. Um, so this is the one that we would have done our event on. Um, and this is like their current vintage. So they've only produced Rare um, in kind of very kind of special years. So this is only the 11th that they've released since 1976. Wow. Um, so yeah, 70% Chardonnay, 30% Pinot Meunier. Pretty sexy bottle. Um Really good juice, man. Really, really good champagne. That's one of those things, you know I mean? Like Thursday night, I was at Champagne Academy uh, down at Coombe Abbey. So we had a dinner there. Nice. Really nice, really pleasant. Um, and we basically had like champagne dinner with like all these people. And it was, I've seen I that. Know. You put it on your Insta. Did you have you, two glasses with each dish? Yeah, so basically you had like a star. Oh, I, mean, I was like, there's no way he's having two glasses per dish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, we had like um, two glasses uh, with your starter, two glasses with your fish course, two glasses with your mains, and then two of your dessert. Oh, man. 
But then you know what happens because people start leaving. You go mine sweeping because there's like bottles left around, <laughs> and there's always that like, couple of bottles that you go, oh, no one's no one's shifted into that one, chef. So you just go in there like you're walking around with champagne flutes, like you all kind of you all start off really kind of polite, you know. Everyone's in black tie, everyone's having a good time, and you're like, gets about three hours later, you know, and everyone's yeah. like, you have like champagne on arrival, so you there, and it's good because obviously like. There's some of the guys who I met from like four or five years ago. I've been doing it for the last six, seven years. And obviously the last two years we haven't been able to go. And um, you're there and you're like talking to these all these old folks, like white middle class, you know, really, really kind of elegantly spoken people. So you kind of have to raise your game a little bit, you know, so you're in your black tie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then come about 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, man, everyone's like, yeah, back on normal, you know, it's like... Just get the champagne in, you know, <laughs> just pour it out. But yeah, I mean, it's just it's one of those jobs, I think, when you're a sommelier and you're able to kind of have those opportunities, you know? You know, it's like people will say, right, well, you know what? Would you like to be an ambassador for Krug? Or would you like to come on our tasting for two days? Would you like to come to Italy? Or can we take you to France? You can go to the vineyards. And it's like, yeah, I mean, even in England, you go to some amazing wineries in England now, you know? It's like, I mean, last week I was down in Cornwall, was at Camel Valley. Um, Danbury Ridge is really good down in Essex. And you just kind of educating yourself by going there, you know? You're meeting the people who pick the grapes, who look after the vineyards. And it's one of those nice things about it. It's like, well, yeah, you work hard because that's where you want to kind of get yourself to. It's like, I know who Richard is who makes the wine at A, B, and C or whatever, you know? Yeah. You kind of build that relationship up with those suppliers and you kind of, well, this is what we do and this is how we want to tell the story to the guests because you're a nice guy. Is the one trip that stands out that you've been on? Um, uh, oh, man. You know, to be, with Krug, it's been pretty amazing. I mean, I've been to Piemonte. So by this time last year, it came up on my finger. I was, I was me, me and Chef Glynn. I uh, went to um, Piazza Duomo, which is three-star Michelin in uh, Piedmont. So we had like white truffles. And they were just like, just shaving truffle like it was cheddar cheese, man. <laughs> oh, man. I was like, yo, this is levels, man. Like, and this is something I wouldn't be able to do, you know, like on an everyday kind of basis. And like, you go into a three-star restaurant. I mean, we went to Alicante, um, Cadiz in Spain. Uh, France is amazing. They'll take you to two star, three stars. You stay in like luxury hotels, and you're like, this is like, this is what hospitality is all about. You know, this is why you kind of want to work hard because these. It's not just about work life balance or kind of financial gain. It's like you kind of look after like what you're capable of doing and what you want to do, and you're able to get these opportunities. You know, and it will all come down to like what you put in. You know, if you really want to kind of learn and educate and progress yourself, it's like. I really want to do that. I'd love to have your job. And people come in and go, oh yeah, your job's fucking amazing. And yeah, it is. I have a great job and I'm very, very fortunate. You know, I get to drink wine, drink champagne. I get to go on holidays. But it's down to like what you want as well in, in regards to when you're working in hospitality, you know? Yeah, you I have mean, to put the hours in to get you to You have to put level. the graft in, you know? And that's the kind of reward that you want people to see, you know? So I mean, I've also joined the, uh, the Choose Hospitality, um, which is like a big movement trying to get and getting under understanding people to get back into the industry, you know, uh, to be inclusive. So it's kind of like BAME professionals, uh, which is kind of set up during lockdown. And it was trying to say, well, how do we get like different ethnicities back into the industry, but also choose hospitality where it's like, what can we, how, how do we make hospitality look good? Yeah, work-life balance is hard. Yeah, money may not be the greatest, but once you get up the ladder, you know, it's where you reap your reward. You know, you can't just expect to be earning super great salaries if you've not really kind of done the graft, you know? That's why I've always said to anyone who's kind of walked into the restaurant, I'll be like, you know, the more you're going to put in, the more you're going to get out, you know? Don't come and think of it as just like a job where it's nine to five and you just need to go and do that or do what you need to and go home. You've got to take it like a, like it's your life, it's your passion, you know? You can't come in in a bad mood, you know, if like your, your cat's not feeling well or those things you can't leave because you're looking after the guests now, you know? It's nearly a vacation, isn't it? Like, it's... But then it, it's looked upon as if it's just like a stepping stone job. And how do you change? How do you think you change that? Like yeah, I mean, I mean it. it's been really cool. And he's been like, look, man, I want to try and look after the the team here. So, I mean, we, we've been very fortunate. We haven't lost any staff over lockdown. Um, I know lots of other restaurants, lots of lots of hospitality, even like going down to like delivery drivers and stuff. You know, everyone's suffering somewhere. Yeah, I suppose you're trying to say, show them that there's so many great, opportunities in in working in hospitality that actually yeah you know if you work hard you can see and really get some great kind of rewards i mean we're doing like flexible days we actually you know if you need a day off for an event or you're not feeling well 
you don't take it as a holiday. You just have, have your time out there, for example, you know. We're very flexible with people's rotors. Our wages are very, very competitive. Um, we're even like our trunk system is divvied out really, really well. So those who are earning the least actually earn most of the trunk. Um, so Trunk's it's, the tip system, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, so that's the tip system, yeah. you know. So that's all kind of departmentalized. Um, but we've got a small team. And yeah, I mean, it's like trying to look after everyone, you know. It's like people get their holiday uh, entitlements, working hours, we're all very, very flexible. You know, and those are the small things where, you know, if you need to go away somewhere for the afternoon, yeah, no problem, you know. Put it in, put it in the group to come in at six o'clock for service. Those are the kind of things. And it's like someone like, for example, Luby is a restaurant manager. She'll tend to leave earlier, which means I like I can start later because I prefer to come in late and say till the end. And you just work out and say, well, what will get the most kind of productiveness out of the team, you know? Mm. If I come in at 10 o'clock, chances are I'm going to be ratty as fuck. Because I don't like waking up in the morning. I'm a late, I'm a late, <laughs> late bloomer. Um, but I don't mind staying until two o'clock in the morning, for example, you know. Um, and I suppose having that right balance and getting to know what works for everyone, because that's what's going to help make the business successful as well, you know. I think that's a really good thing, and I think you, we need more em- employers like Alex and teams like yourself, managers like yourself. We definitely need more of them in the industry, but we. We, we just need more people talking positively about the job as well. That will help. You know, uh, so many people are just so like derogatory about hospitality and yeah. chefs and waitresses. And yeah, waiters. I mean, I mean, you're right. I mean, even like, Liam, when I was before lockdown, I mean, I went to the UCB because like, I mean, like I, I, when I was at uni, like the students, I mean, sorry, the lecturers just thought, oh yeah, you're just here for a fucking piss take. <laughs> and like, obviously then worked at Pernell's, I got to uh, manager and won an award and it's like, Actually, it's almost like I've got this gone full circle. It's like, wow, you know, now they're asking me to go in and do a talk and like sh- help them with their like placements and stuff. And it's great because, I mean, if I didn't have the right guidance at my stage, I don't know which way I, I could have been. And same as I always reflect on the, the, the guy who basically didn't give me the job. I was like, you know what? I want to prove you wrong, man. That guy on my placement, even to this day, like 17 years later, I'm like, that guy didn't give me that job. So I'm basically showing him what he's missed out on, you know? Do you have these kind of small things in your in in your mind that you kind of think, I need to make this show what a great industry it is, you know, the people that you meet. And yeah, you get some amazing perks, you know, and it is only when you get into it after a while, you know, it's not just like, right, you know, you're working in a bar and, you know, you're just a bar back. Those people who do really, really well go, oh, do you reckon I can learn how to make a drink? Or can I learn how you do this? Those are the people who are going to try and learn and do something, whereas not those people who have to go, oh, fucking, I have to go into work today. You know, you, 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 <laughs> yeah. we all do that, you know. There's always times, even whatever industry it is, you know. Yeah. It's always like Sunday, we're going back to work on Monday, you know. It's like, oh, man, I'm going to work. And you kind of think, well, why can't it be enjoyable, you know? Hospitality like, is special. I feel like everyone should do a little stint in hospitality. 100%, man. Build I mean, your empathy, character builds. Well, I mean, the thing is, hospitality is not just about serving food and serving wine, you know. It's like you learn about finances, you learn about how to clean. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so you can cover like seven industries, you know. It's like... How to be an agony aunt. Exactly. Listen to people. (laughs) Exactly, man. Dear Deirdre. (laughs) On the sun newspaper. Tuesday. I used to work in a pub on a Tuesday. It was like one one lonely bloke at the bar just telling you about his divorce. And he needs that. You might be the only person he speaks to on that day, you know. Uh, Honestly, I'll have a a guest in, comes on his own, and I talk to him about how his dogs are and stuff. Do you know what I mean? It's like it's an industry where you learn so much and you are you cross-reference so many other industries, and people forget that. You know, they forget, actually, you know what, all you're doing is like putting a knife and a fork down, you're introducing your filter beef. But it's like, I'm talking to you about, I don't know, finances, admin, you know, you're looking at supply chain, how you work with producers, you know, how to look at all these small little things. And it's like, yeah, you're kind of covering lots of different bases here. And until you kind of really understand what hospitality is all about, you know, and even like, even when we go to like different restaurants, you know, like, I mean, like, I was at the Ugly Butterfly down in Cornwall, Carbis Bay, which is amazing, um, with Adam Hanlon and stuff. And you get all to meet all these people along the journey, you know? So it's like, even if you go, right, you know what, I'm going to look for a new job. You know, you can make a couple of phone calls and, like, oh, we know who you are or where you're from or what you're doing. Everyone kind of knows a little bit about, about each other, you know? And there are those places where you go, yeah, you know, wh- where would you want to be your next step? Do you want to work in this kind of restaurant or do you want to still work in gastro bars or gastro pubs or whatever, you know? 
And just so so vast hospitality is like I think I think it's a great industry and yeah it's hard, um, but we just got to try and make the most of it and try to encourage people to kind of get back into the industry, you know. Encourage people to choose a positive place to work as well, a good place to work because there's so oh. many chefs like, yeah, I'd like to work there, but this other place, I know it's shit, but it pays really good money. And, and that's just the saying, thing, mate. Forget about the money for now. Work at that other place that's really cool, really good. You're going to be excited about going to work every day and you'll find that you'll enjoy it a lot more than the other place that's paying you that money that you'll waste on something anyway. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's been lots of people who've kind of come out of the industry. I mean, like, for example, I mean, you look at Poppy, man, fair play to her, man, on TikTok, like, smash it, has got a book deal. And you're like, yeah, man, I mean, bless her, like, she got made redundant, probably living on out in, in London, like, how would you survive, you know? So many people who've lost their jobs and stuff and you're kind of thinking, well, what do you do to kind of come back stronger, you know? Yeah, it's a really, really kind of hard, hard industry to kind of be in. But you're right, you know, if you've got the right people around you who want to kind of look after you and support you, like, for example, with Alex, you know, he's like, look, he wants to help build the portfolio of myself, but put me on the magazine, you know, on our wine list, the drinks list, where you've got, like, pictures and photos, and especially with social media and stuff. It all helps, you know, and this is sometimes it's a small thing. You're like, it's not all about finance, you know. It's like, well, actually, you know what? I get looked after. I can start at 2 o'clock on a Wednesday. I've got Thursday off for a wine tasting, you know, those are the small things for me is what I can consider a great working relationship. You know, if I need to speak to Alex, I can give him a call. How's everything going? Ra rah, rah, need a discussion. As long as you come here and you deliver what you need to when you're at work, you know, you're, you're, everyone will uh, win, you know? Yeah, definitely. You kind of touched it. You were, you kind of started off with a plan to be a chef, but never really, you, you went a drastically different way. Do you still cook or anything? Or? Yeah, man. So over, over lockdown, I loved it. I mean, I've got, um, I've done lots of like Indian cooking. So like my mum, uh, dad, both both Indian. So Do you have a favourite dish from your childhood? That oh, you man, lamb cook? chops. My mum used yeah. to make lamb chops. Yeah, man. I made once over, over lockdown. Um, so it's just like a lamb curry. Just like potatoes, lamb chops, braised them for like three hours. Um, that was probably my favourite. So I, I basically made that. Made lots of chickpeas. To be fair, I mean, I did lots of vegetarian food over lockdown. Mm. I mean, the thing is, when you're on lockdown, you wake up and all you're thinking about is what the fuck am I going to eat? <laughs> so what am I drinking and what am I going to eat? But that's us every day. Yeah, that's not lockdown. <laughs> Honestly, man, it's it was... It, day ended in why? Yeah, that, that's what it was. It was like, wake up, watch a little bit of uh, television, and then you're like, right, what am I going to cook tonight? So we'll go, do, let's go get, get some pork belly, get some wedges, get do this, let's marinate it. Uh, yeah, I completely forgot because obviously Laura, your uh, partner, she's head chef at Salt now, isn't she? Head chef at Salt, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So who does most of the cooking? Is it? Uh, well, we over lockdown, we were kind of taking turns, you know. Um, she did more of the extravagant stuff, man. I was the one, <laughs> the one pot wonder, man. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because like, I don't like it, man. I've got a small apartment, right? But like, when she cooks, she's gonna hate me now. But it's just like lots of pay, lots of pots, lots of pans, yeah. lots of prep, lot of mise on. I'm like, you know, what? I'm just gonna throw my onions in there, the cumin seeds, cook it up. There you are, done. But yeah, I mean, I I, I tried to do most of the cooking. Like, did like lentils, chickpea curries, um, did a couple of boxes, like Actar's boxes, killer. Yeah, I've still yet to get my hands on one. Oh Someone man, to get sell one out all the time. They just sell out. Oh, they they are like I tell you, my sister she lives up in Edinburgh she buys them she was like yeah man. you get like ten curries out of it like I'm not just not an advert but um, <laughs> yeah like for me I was like yeah this I I, I think you cook at home at that cheap you know but yeah I was doing lots of Indian food made some samosas and stuff I've got some samosas tonight actually uh, nice. lamb samosas mum's recipe yeah but my mum's been a been a great help for that you know if I go to visit her just after we were able to go visit people she lives in Wolverhampton. Um, so we go there, she'll have like some samosas there for me, my nice little cup of tea and that. Um, and she'll do the cooking, but yeah, I mean, lots of cooking depends on really my mood. Like, I mean, we'll have, we'll have steak sometimes. Um, I try and kind of keep myself occupied. That's why the belt doesn't really fit too much on this, <laughs> on the thing. It's a good thing I don't wear a suit anymore, man. The apron <laughs> covers it all up, man, you know. Yeah, um, I mean, them buttons aren't done over the oh, belly. Well, yeah, I'll mate. tell you what. I've got lots of shirts like that. Again. I look at my wardrobe now, man. I'm like, shit, man. These are really nice shirts, man. And they're just like, <laughs> maybe one day I'll fit back into them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've got a whole box of clothes like that. Yeah, that's all right, man. Don't worry, man. What happened? You know, it's just dedication. It's like something you got to realize that even after lockdown, you're like, there's so much more to to life than work. You know, so when when you go to work, why don't you just make sure you enjoy it? You know, mm, make 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 most of the time. You know. Enjoy it and embrace it. Not, not just think, oh, I have to go to work. 
just have that positivity, you know. It's, things would be a lot worse, you know. I don't know if you were half joking. You said something about a wine bar earlier in the future. Do you have any plans in the in the distant future for your own place? I mean, who, who knows? You know, I mean, if I win the Euro Millions, you know, <laughs> you you guys, but you guys get the VIP invites. Don't worry. <laughs> um, no, but I just thought, you know, if you like, if you like, I like dirty food. You know, like, if I like fried chicken, I'll be like, you know, what can I have a nice like uh, a nice glass of champagne or a really nice glass of Burgundy? You know, it's, there's very f- few places that will say, well, actually, you know what, I really like good wine. But I don't really like the kind of fancy dining element. So it's like, well, how do you kind of bring a little bit of those into best of both worlds, you know? If you want a nice cheeseburger and you go out a nice glass of Pinot Noir or just a homemade spaghetti bolognese, but really good glass of Italian red wine, for example. Yeah. I just imagine you sitting in KFC with that bottle next to you. Like, yeah, <laughs> you tell you brought what, it in yourself. Like. Uh, on my birthday, I had a bottle of champagne and I had um, fried chicken. Yeah. And, I, and I had a bottle of Krug uh, 96 with those lime and uh, coriander poppadoms. Yeah. That was my that was my aperitif. <laughs> Damn, well, but I was like, you know what? It's just like simple things sometimes, and it's like, you know what? Let let the wine talk. But just having the simple food, you know, and I think that's that's probably where my head's at. It's just like, well, just want to entertain myself with good wine and just like good grub. Yeah. Do you have any sort of insider tips about wine? Because only like you get red and loads of people decant it. Like, yeah. do you have to be doing this stuff, or is there? Is there just basic tips you could give to people that would really like sort of help them out? I think, um, I mean, Carl, I think the best thing to do sometimes is like, I'd always say like, maybe go to the supermarket, take like eight, nine pounds and maybe try a couple of different wines that you never tried before. So like not to be scared because I think when you come to a restaurant, you're going to spend upwards of 40 pounds on a bottle. It's a lot more than what you're going to be spending in a supermarket, you know? And uh, you've got some amazing independent wine shops. I'd always kind of say, well, give them a little try, you know, like obviously you've got like Loki doing amazing stuff with the animatic, so you can go and have a little taste of a little sample. Yeah. And then obviously that. if you like it, have a go. Um, I mean, I think when it comes to decanting wine, I mean, some people never really know that actually you can decant white wine. So you've got like really kind of full flavor, full body styles of white wine, have them kind of opening up in a decanter to get really quite expressive. Uh, glassware is always quite important as well. Uh, even the temperature of your wine, you know, like sometimes, you know, in the summertime, maybe have your red wine served slightly chilled, you know. If you're drinking lighter, fruitier red wines, maybe have them served a little bit chilled so you can kind of really get more fruit. For the glass, you mean like the size of the glass or something? Yeah, I mean, yeah. so champagne, for example, so this is like a tulip glass. So normally you go to a, a place and they serve it in a flute. Mm. But I mean, that kind of doesn't really give you the right kind of appreciation for the champagne. So the idea is you drink it and it goes straight to the back of your throat. Whereas if you drink from a tulip, you get a little bit more evolution. So glassware is really, really important. And again, it's always find, finding what you want, you know. Um, I think, yeah, budget. I mean, never try and go for anything for like the least expensive in a place. Because I mean, I was, there's an article I read that basically cost like £3.50 for all the basic stuff that goes into, well, outside of the bottle, you know, the supply, yeah. the bottle, the label. So you're going to get £1.50 worth of juice. So if you spend £8, you're actually getting £4.50 worth of juice. So you're spending £3 more we're getting better quality juice for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, it is like, I mean, if you're in the industry, it's like going down to, to tastings, um, seeing what's what's available. Even if you want to do like level one for yourself, like let's say you want to have an understanding about what wine is and where it comes from. It's like, do a little bit of the, the, the studying behind it, you know? Um, but it's one of those things you'll never stop learning about, you know? It's, it's always kind of evolving, always developing. There's always something that's quite new on the scene, something that's kind of like... Um, flavor of the month um but i think it's all about just like do reading get, get yourself involved um try and attend tastings and yeah don't, don't be afraid to to ask questions Cause sometimes people can be quite intimidated when they come to a restaurant you know and it's like well if i make you at ease you know i want you to have a good time you know i, I don't want to come across as a snob where you know very very formal and if you want to spend 50 quid i want to get 200 quid out of you it doesn't work like that you know i might even recommend you a wine that's like 45 pounds or 40 quid and you'll be like shit that guy isn't trying to mug me off. It's not about that. It's just trying to be honest to the guests and say, well, I know what you're looking for and I can deliver that less than what you want to spend. You know, it's about being honest to the guests as well sometimes, you know, and that's sometimes what's, what's, what's quite important. Where's the value for money? And you want to say, well, actually, everything that we've listed there is all value for money because I would be happy enough to pay for those prices for it, you know? Yeah, Carl does his uh, questions. He does like a few quick fire for quick fire questions well, no, we, we always call them rapid fire but they're never rapid fire ages like. to answer them including <laughs> me when I when we sat down yeah, and did our yeah, own yeah, versions yeah. of this it took us ages to come up with the answers uh, what's your favourite movie 
Oh man. Just about to start thinking. See, I told you, they're not quick. <laughs> no, it's, it's one of those ones where people always ask you a question and you're like, shit, man. Um, Shawshank Redemption. Good choice. A lot of people have said that. What's your favourite TV show? Um, all time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what, I was watching, um, I was watching this programme on Channel 5 yesterday and they were going about all the 90s, uh, all the 90s comedies and like goodness gracious me and the real McCoy was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Desmond's was pretty cool back in the day. Yeah, I like Desmond. Desmond's was cool, man. Um, I think, um, I, I actually watched uh, A League of Their Own, Sky One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's probably one of my kind of favourite. I like, I like a bit of comedy and stuff like that, to be fair. Yeah, cool. If you could only ever have tea or coffee again, which one would you have? I uh, tea. I, I stopped drinking coffee. I, I used to get too excited a few times, like four or five espressos in a day, and I was like, "Well, hold on a second, man." <laughs> I started having the shakes and stuff like that, so I was like, "No, nah, I might just put that one, uh, put that off." What's your favorite band or artist? <sighs> See, no, although we play rock and roll, right? Because I've actually really kind of started listening to it myself, even outside of work, which is weird. Because I'm a bit more of a kind of grime hip hop, a uh, hip hop fan. Yeah. Um. So I, if I probably have to say someone, I'll probably have to say Kano. Nice. Grime scene. Have you got a favorite cookbook? Uh, you know what? To be fair, man, Chef uh, Chef Glenn gave me his uh, his new book, The Pernell's Journey one. That's sensational. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, man. That was really, really nice. It was gifted to me. Uh, it's an it's an amazing book. Like the the photos, the recipes, and that the stories in there are incredible. You don't have to answer this one, but do you have a favourite wine? Um, for me, <laughs> I, I think that, I think it's that loaded question. What about, I think, what about right, like <laughs> variety or grape or something? Maybe like that. I'm I'm, I'm a big fan of obviously champagne. Uh, I really like Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. So Pinot Noir a little bit more kind of lighter, kind of refined, kind of red, and Chardonnay quite kind of rich and robust, so like Californian Chardonnays. Um, but um. I think probably my, my favourite champagne, my favourite wine of all time is probably Krug 1996 Vintage. Um, that's probably my favourite of all time. Nice. What's your favourite big fast food chain? Boy, that's got to be McDonald's, isn't it? It's got to be popular Mac answer, real popular I mean, you know, answer. I mean, the thing is, it's like, I shouldn't even really tell you what I order, man, but I get too excited, you know? Sometimes I get, I'm on my way home and I click like 20 chicken nuggets three times and look at my bill. I was like, nah, <laughs> that's definitely not right. I look back as I like, 60 chicken. Nah, I didn't, I didn't order that. It's doable, though, ain't it? What do you yeah. order? Uh, what do I order? Double quarter pound with cheese meal. Yeah. Triple cheeseburger and 20 chicken nuggets. Nice. But I'll only get through about eight or 10 of the chicken nuggets, but you have to get the right balance in it. You have to go for the chicken nuggets first, then a few chips, then eat for the burgers. Mix it up a bit. And then if you've got any space left, Sweet curry sauce, jobs are good. In. But then I might like keep it and then maybe if I wake up in the morning, like three hours later, I can go back to it after. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's just, you know why? It's, it's just consistent, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know, it's like, you, you, don't, you know what you're going to have automatically. So it's like, don't make your life hard. <laughs> Dirty food time. But I mean, yeah, I think, I think that um, in terms of fast food chain, yeah, Mac is probably, probably the one, you know. Favourite takeaway? In Birmingham or just in general? Just like what you order, Indian, Chinese, pizza. What do you um, order? What's your favourite one? Oh, you know, it's going to be like fried chicken and burgers, to be fair, man. I think, like, I love chicken wings. Probably my favourite thing to eat. Yeah. Um, one, so, like, I've been to, like, Wingstop. Or if I go to, like, Henning Chickens, get all the chicken wings from there. Love them. Um, but, I mean, I, I even love, I'll, I'll have pizza every now and then as well. Do you know what I mean? Like, some great places in, in Birmingham to eat pizza. Um, in Edinburgh, I had the place like they had like twenty inch pizza, and they had like a slice which is like the size of a normal pizza. Yeah. I think it's very similar to the guys you did with the podcast yeah, with that yeah, pizza yeah, place. Yeah, it's yeah. New New York inspired one, yeah. and you just sitting there and you go, yeah, this is this is what I want, man. It's all you need, anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> What's your best food destination in the world or drink destination? Or do you have either? Oh, I like these questions, Carl. Man, um, where would my food destination be? I think probably maybe be uh, Lyon, south of France, maybe. Nice. I think probably maybe like to kind of try some more of those kind of classic flavors. Probably won't do too good for my gut, but uh, all that kind of rich cream <laughs> and that. But I think I, there's, there's something quite magical about it, you know. Uh, and I think if I was to go to pick pick a place in the world for wine, maybe Australia. I'd love to maybe go like southern Australia because it's quite far away. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody listening, give me a shout, yeah? Um, <laughs> I, think that, I think Australia would be pretty amazing. My, my brother-in-law's from Australia um, and he brings over and sends over a couple of nice bottles of wine whenever he's like, comes up to Christmas, his parents will send some over. Um, 
But it's just, it, yeah, I mean, there's so, so many great places in the world for, for food and wine, man. How about yourselves? Yeah, food. Uh, food and drink, actually, is Japan. Yeah. Definitely. I'm going for a city. I'm probably going Kyoto. Not Kyoto, oh. sorry. Osaka. Oh, in the south? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unreal. For food, it's just crazy. And the drink, they love drinks so much in Japan. Yeah. Including wine. Wine's Yeah, but I mean, champagne is, like one, is one of the biggest sellers in the world now. It's like third or fourth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's for me, definitely. I want to try, I want to go to Stockholm real bad. Stockholm, yeah. Stockholm's amazing. Esca, is it Eskadet? Eskadet. That's it. And um, Franzen. What's it? Franzen. Franzen. Yeah. So my best friend lives in Sweden. So um, pre-lockdown, I've been, so we went to Gastrologic, uh, which is now two star. I went to Franzen when it was a two star, then now three. So I went when it was in the old Stockholm. Um, still paying for that. It's <laughs> yeah, not fucking cheap. It's man. not cheap. Yeah, I, looked it's at, I looked at it, I looked at it, I was like, I first they went uh, hotel, yeah, oh, that's all right. <laughs> and then I went flights. I was like, oh, yeah, that's really good. And then I looked at the menu, I was like, well, that's oh. so good. <laughs> <laughs> we went, yeah, we went, to, we went to Exeter as well. So I think, I don't know if they've got two stars. Obviously, he's opened up the place in London. Yeah, but, I think he's just got one still. Yeah. Like, I've just got the book, so I'm a bit obsessed with it. Yeah, he's, he's a pretty cool guy, man. Like, we yeah. met, we met, when we went to eat there, we, I think we went about five years ago. And we were, we were eating, and we had a small, small, small restaurant. And the kitchen, you go in the back. And it got like this, the stoves, like almost like a pizza oven. You feel like you're there. And the man there is putting the fire in, and, like the way they have to time the cooking. So they have to move it forward, move it back. But the Franzen meal, when I, when I went, it was mind blowing. Obviously, they're three star now, like one of the best in the world. Yeah, Akhtar and Leo we know and a few others went there. They've yeah. all said the they same just said thing. It was yeah. just a different unreal. level. Like. Yeah. I went, I went um, when it was like 10 seat a restaurant, um, and we had the kitchen table. And you're there, and you're looking at the guys, and there's like 30 courses, man. That was sensational i mean lots of i've been very very fortunate especially with like with krug and stuff like taking me away they we've got to eat in like three stars two stars and you're like man this is getting to try on yeah this is like the dream you know this is like absolutely amazing it's like that is what i said you know it's down to doing i'm not saying hard work but it's like being in the right place but showing that you want to do well to be rewarded for that you know yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not letting them get away that's you ain't been there yet this is the question was what's your favorite food destination just not a massive traveler like yeah um, new york was pretty good man yeah i can imagine new, new york was, awesome. was good when did you go really hard, i've been there tw- three times two times i can't remember been a few times uh last time i went for paddy's day about i shouldn't know because i got engaged about 10 years ago and uh yeah just everything about it just Shake Shack when it was just like in Madison Park yeah. and it was like a four hour queue uh, just been able to grab a pizza and then you go to like Chinatown yeah. uh, Tribeca oh it's everything about yeah. I could live in New York man. Yeah. I, could live it, in New York. I, mean, I went years ago and I went to uh, WD50 which is why the friends um, when he his like, restaurant was like one of the top in the world at the time and when you talk about going into a restaurant, you don't know where it is. It was like a fucking, like, you know when you go to a Chinese kind of takeaway and you've got like massive kind of plastic around the front. You don't know where it is. Tax driver goes, yeah, here it is. You go in there, it's like, yeah, next level. Like, he does like donuts and stuff now, but he's like, he's on MasterChef USA. Yeah, it, it's, it's beautiful. But at four, you're right, four o'clock in the morning, you go get Subway. Thank you very much. Boys, thanks very much for having me, you know. Uh, you've enjoyed it. Awesome. We really appreciate your time and you have us down to it one of our favourite restaurants. Oh, well, <laughs> hopefully we'll get to get you, uh, see you guys come in to, uh, for something to eat, you know, and uh, oh, yeah, have a real yeah. party, you know. We'll be in there, don't worry about that. <laughs> Thanks very much, Sonal. Thank you very much, boys. Thanks, everyone.